Good morning. 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 Good morning. One second, please. Is that any better? My apologies for the feedback. I'm not sure where that's coming from. One moment, please.
All right, folks, good morning. Can everybody hear me? I don't know if I need the headphones. Can you all hear me now? Oh, yes, I do need the yes. Apparently. All right. Good morning, everybody, and um, our apologies for the technical issues. We have um, tried to avoid them, but it always seems that it's inevitable. Um, it is my name, my pleasure to welcome you this morning and to thank you for your patience. My name is Janetta Candelario, and I'm the editor of Meridian Feminism, Race, Transnationalism, and this is the second panel of our 20th anniversary celebration, day two. Um, this is our um, uh, Whose Speech Acts? Naming Violence at Home and Abroad panel, uh, which will be moderated by our Meridian Editorial Advisory Board member, Pinky Hota, who is an assistant professor of anthropology here at Smith College. We are having technical challenges getting Pinky on board, so I'm stepping in. Um, and joining us today for this uh, conversation are Sunera Sobani and Lisa Majaj from Cyprus. Uh, and uh, it is such an honor to have you with us today, to finally meet you in person, because we've only been emailing for about a year now. Um, and I just want to thank you again for your contributions to Meridians. Um, originally, uh, uh, in Sunera's case, many years ago, both of you actually were published in one of our earliest issues of the journal. Um, and for coming back, when I was writing with uh, Lisa last year as I was preparing the 20th anniversary reader, which is what the conference is organized around, Lisa, you said to me that you went back and reread your essay uh, and were both struck, moved, and saddened by the fact that so little has changed uh, in in Palestine uh, in the 20 years since you first wrote that essay. And I believe, Sunera, you said something similar in our email exchange, that as you reflected back on, first of all, the experience, um, your essay was called War Frenzy, um, and the experience that you narrate and document of how your comments at a conference about 9-11, um, whose 20th anniversary we are celebrating, marking, commemorating this year, um, how those the comments themselves were received for the inappropriateness of your making them rather than for dealing with the substance of what you were saying about uh, uh, who's truly uh, behaving in terroristic fashion, right? What is truly terrorism um, in the world and the role of uh, governments such as the United States and Canada uh, in those larger contexts and uh, uh, policies. Um, so. Um, as we were thinking about an appropriate name for this conversation between the two of you, um, this question of speech acts came to mind, right? Because to return as a frame in your work, Lisa, and as a, as a frame for understanding Palestinian diasporic and home experiences uh, and war frenzy in your um, uh, uh, essay, Sunera. So um, while Pinky uh, uh, joins us, I'm going to ask you to, to um, reflect. Could you introduce yourselves for us? Because I didn't read your bios. They are in our program. But if you could just tell us a little bit about who you are today, who you were 20 years ago, and about um, writing those essays at that moment as an opening for, for this conversation. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I don't know who'd like to start. Nera, I'll, I'll point to you because you're on my left. And it's always good oh, to start from the left. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, I'd like to begin by thanking Meridians for uh, inviting me to be here on this panel. It's a real honor. And also, thank you for publishing my essay. I've had a hell of a job getting my work published in feminist journals. And that continues to be the case even now. So I was grateful then, and I'm even more grateful now. Um, uh, the, uh, I also would like to begin by acknowledging that I'm on indigenous territories, uh, that I live on Coast Salish territories, Vancouver, um, uh, at the university where I teach, the University of British Columbia, it's on Musqueam territories. And I say this to draw everybody's attention to the fact that indigenous peoples are involved in struggles of sovereignty over this land, and it behooves all of us to um, uh, build solidarity with those struggles. Um, I'll also say just one quick comment about what a terrible moment we're meeting in. Uh, the effects of COVID-19 around the world are just horrific. Uh, and, you know, I just want us to acknowledge um, how much um, uh, terrible destruction is going on at this very moment. Uh, so uh, when I wrote the essay, of course, uh, you know, it was not meant as an academic piece to be published in any journal. 
um, you know, I've given a speech at a conference on violence against women. And my intention is give Okay, there we go. Megan's got us in hand. Um, I'm sorry, Sunura, to interrupt. I see that Pinky Hota has been able to join us now. Um, Megan, are you able to pop me out and, and, and bring Pinky in so she can take over from here? Sunura was just opening her comments, Pinky, so we'll just let her proceed if you don't mind. Yes, okay, good. Right. I'm so sorry. I'm, so sorry. I'm, not, I'm, not I'm going sure. to turn this over to Megan. There you go. It's echoing again. Hi, all. My apologies. Um, I'm not sure where the feedback's coming from. Pinky, can we hear you? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, you need to make sure that you don't have this tab open in multiple windows. And I think that's the main issue we're having here. Can we try? So you just want to check and make sure you don't have it open anywhere else but the tab that you're in. That is the issue we were running into before. Seem to have. Yes. I still have everything closed up, but should I refresh it? Um, if, okay. Um, is there another browser open or anything? Okay. One moment. Um, how are you sounding now? Can you hear me? It's quite an echo. Sorry. I closed everything down over there. Sorry, Pinky. I'm not sure where the echo is coming from. Can we try again? Okay, there you go. I, yes, I just okay, refreshed there we are. my browser. There we are. Go ahead. I refreshed my browser a couple of times. And yes, thank you. Yeah. I apologize for all the technical troubles. Um, even though I've been here since the panel before, I think, yeah, technology can always throw me for a loop. Um, Welcome everybody uh, to our panel uh, entitled Whose Speech Acts Naming Violence at Home and Abroad. Um, and I'm so honored to be in conversation with these two incredible scholars um, today. And I will begin with a brief introduction. I know that you had probably already gotten started and Professor Thawani was mid-thought when I sort of came back in. Mm -hmm. But um, with your kind permission, maybe I'll just say uh, do a much more compressed introduction and uh, just draw out uh, uh, some things for us to talk about. Um, so uh, uh, Professor Sunera Thobani is Professor of Asian Studies at the University of British Columbia. Um, and uh, she's the author of Exalted Subjects, Studies in the Making of Race and Nation in Canada, and the co-editor of two other volumes, States of Race, Critical Race Feminism for the 21st Century and Asian Women, Interconnections. Um, her essay today is, uh, uh, is actually a, a, a deeply disturbing, at, at some level, essay uh, written from her own experience. Um, uh, it's entitled War Frenzy, um, and it, it talks about um, how she made a speech uh, against the war on terror um, at a conference on violence against women, following which she was publicly attacked and threatened for hate mongering. And she uses her first person narrative um, to talk about how her speech was treated in the public controversy as too incendiary um, and used to shut down any sort of political opposition to the invasion of, of Afghanistan and how this event um, became a site in which she was um, cast and inscribed as, um, I quote, an ungrateful and hate-filled immigrant woman. Um, and it's a deeply personal essay, and I thank her for uh, sharing her personal experiences and willing, being willing to um, talk about something which has, I can imagine was 
incredible um, amount of, uh, brought her an incredible amount of discomfort and pain. Um, I have so much more to say about it, but I will introduce our second panelist first before uh, I do say more. Um, Lisa Suher Majaj is a scholar and a poet who has co-edited three volumes on international women writers. Um, and her books include the prize-winning poetry volume, Geographies of Light, which was published in 2009, and a children's book, um, Nabila Shares a Story. Um, and she's widely published, of course, and she currently lives in Cyprus, uh, where she teaches and uh, continues to publish poetry. Um, and uh, Lisa's essay today uh, for today is, again, um, uh, an essay which will form, um, gives us a, a very important platform for which to sort of bring these two papers into conversation with one another, because she's writing about, um, in some ways, the impossibility of return, which I will um, come to and talk to, uh, talk about further. But um, she situates the Palestinian right of return within the context of Palestinian American literary reflections and um, locates this conversation at the intersections of women's and human rights. Um, Lisa is talking about, this is again a, a really powerful essay, and Lisa is kind of critiquing the dichotomy of nationalism and feminism in her exploration of how Pal Palestinian American literature uh, emerging from personal and political displacement narrates a literary claim to both reclamation and transformation in which return to return is to claim what was lost and to construct Palestinian reality anew. Um, and again, uh, an essay that I highly urge you to read if you haven't already. Um, and I, I wanted to sort of begin by saying these two essays are such uh, incredible essays to be put into conversation with one another because as uh, Lisa writes in her essay, issues of nationalism and feminism cannot be understood as easily opposed to one another. Um, and for, the, for Lisa, um, she goes on to explain that Palestinian women can be no more expected to choose between their national and gender identities than US women can be expected to choose between being American and being feminist. Um, and moreover, Palestinian women are hardly likely to endorse flight from their own culture as any kind of solution. After 53 years of exile and displacement, they have had enough of flight, as Lisa says. Um, and at, at the same time for uh, Sunera in her essay, this uh, refusal or this easy inability to easily separate questions of nationalism and feminism play out when she is, uh, when nationalist rhetoric is remobilized to cast her as an outsider in a country that she has uh, called home and is critiquing very much from what she felt feels like from an insider's perspective, but she is reinscribed as um, an immigrant woman writing from the outside or speaking from the outside. So I want to thank you both first for your incredible work and for your incredible essays. Um, and I want to begin by uh, sort of asking you about um, one critical thing that both essays share in common. They both bring in the first person narrative. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Donna Haraway has talked about this idea of producing the necessity of producing situated knowledge. Um, and such a situated <clears throat> knowledge sort of refuses the kind of um, objectivity and uh, relativism binary. So, uh, you know, objectivity is kind of takes on this kind of very masculinist. We are writing from a highly objective point of view that has nothing to do with our personal perspectives. Um, it's supposed to be this kind of position of neutrality. And then on the other side is this uh, question of relativism, which uh, is a kind of perspective from nowhere, uh, a perspective where all perspectives are equal and therefore no perspective. Uh, you know, it's a, it, it lacks a perspective in that sense. And both of you bring in your first person accounts and really use it to 
produce a very situated vantage point from which you are narrating and theorizing um, in both your essays. And I wanted to ask you about why you chose to include the autobiographical or write from the autobiographical to produce the situated knowledge of these essays. Um, I mean, I could see you very well kind of more obscure your identities and choose to write it from a more distant perspective. Um, why did you choose to bring in the autobiographical and how is it um, a kind of both fruitful but uh, incredible sort of difficult burden as scholars of color, um, both in your pedagogy and in your writing to bring in the autobiographical. Um, so thank you. Should I go first or Lisa, would you like to go first? Go first, it's fine, yeah. Okay, um, so, um, you know, my speech was actually a political intervention. Um, at the moment uh, when I, it was made, I didn't think of it as autobiographical in any way. Um, you know, I'm kind of, um, as I revisit it, I want to think about it more deeply. Uh, in terms of situated knowledge, I mean, uh, my, my uh, approach is very much that all knowledge is situated knowledge. Um, and so, you know, the project is really to um, show and contest the positions of power from which this position of objectivity is claimed. Uh, and it's not just men and it's not just masculine. If we've learned one thing <laughs> by now is that feminists can also claim that space mm -hmm. and actually do. And this has become so clear to me during the war on terror. Uh, so I, 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 I guess, you know, it was a political intervention and I was, you know, so my situated knowledge, you know, if I was to call it that, uh, what was this based on? What was the vantage point from which I was, I was, you know, speaking the words that I spoke at the time? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was, uh, uh, I had moved and lived in, in many parts of the world. Um, and so I had a kind of, you know, global perspective on politics, mm -hmm. uh, which somehow didn't, uh, you know, uh, 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 wasn't focused or completely contested the idea of Canadian exceptionalism. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So that, that was, you know, one of my vantage points uh, was lived experience, which, uh, uh, you know, um, however one might frame it and think about it. Um, the other thing I could say about my vantage point was that it was based on decades of activism in the women's movement, in the anti-racist movement, immigrant rights movement. And so that was also part of the kind of place from which I was speaking. Most recently, um, I had become, uh, I just uh, finished serving my tenure as the first woman of color president of the National Action Committee on the Status of Women, Canada's largest feminist organization at the time, which in the U.S. context would be the equivalent of now. Mm -hmm. And so the struggle to actually transform the biggest feminist movement in the country was also the vantage point from which I was speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, and to top it all off, I was also, you know, a, a kind of a graduate student at the time. Mm -hmm. So I was also studying and researching <laughs> these these areas. Uh, so so in a way, all of that came together in the speech. And in terms of speaking in the in the in the kind of uh, uh, um, in in in, uh, in that kind of situated voice in the first person, uh, I was doing politics. The intent was to mobilize political opposition uh, uh, to the war on terror and most immediately to Canada's participation in the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know how one does politics except from speaking in, in the kind of, you know, uh, place from which one wants to do this politics and intervene. Uh, and so that's how I thought about what I was doing at, the, at that time. Uh, and, uh, you know, it continues to be for me, um, you know, a, 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 a moment of, in many ways, failed political mobilization, because of course the women's movement ended up supporting the invasion and even the occupation of Afghanistan, uh, mm -hmm. you know, justifying it as uh, saving Afghan women and um, allowing little Afghan girls to go to school, that still remains the Canadian narrative uh, uh, about Canada's role in, in the um, invasion and occupation of Afghanistan. So that's the place from which the speech was made. You know, that's how I understood it. And even looking back on it, 
uh, you know, I see it as a political intervention more than anything else. And unfortunately, uh, and especially now looking at, you know, Canada uh, and, uh, and the U.S., uh, of course, were unable to, you know, uh, maintain their occupation or to remake uh, Afghanistan in whatever vision they had in their, uh, in their plans for it. Uh, and that, of course, has now unleashed the kind of white supremacist politics and movements that we see uh, having moved into the political mainstream and the violence that was initially uh, targeted against Muslims, the Islamophobic discourse can't be separated from this explosion of anti-black violence in, in the uh, U.S. right now, the violence against, you know, uh, other communities of colors, uh, indigenous peoples, the intensification of the occupation in Palestine. Um, right. Uh, so all of these issues are connected, and it is from that vantage point of seeing those connections mm -hmm. that I did intervene in the way that I did. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. That's a wonderful um, statement, and you're so right about the interconnection. Um, my essay also came out of this desire to um, to bring the different issues together. I should say that um, I'm sorry. There's a kind of a light coming on me. Um, and so, first of all, to speak of the Palestinian right of return is to speak of the forbidden. It was true then, and it's true now. To speak of Palestine is to speak of the forbidden. Just today, um, recently, just, just recently, Human Rights Watch put out a report talking about apartheid. They're using the apartheid word. Um, and the report is called The Threshold Crossed. It's not new, but finally it's getting into the mainstream. And as I was scrolling through my Facebook feed, um, somebody had posted something about it. And then there was somebody who said in a comment, Palestine's, Palestinians don't exist. This is, and somebody else, uh, you know, a friend of mine wrote, oh, this again. Um, so this is an old narrative, but this is the narrative out of which I was speaking. The narrative that says Palestine doesn't exist and never existed. Palestinians don't exist as a people and never did. And the right of return, you've got to be crazy to even think about it. Off the map completely. And that's still true today, even in very progressive circles, even in circles working for justice, for equality. You talk about return and that will be completely off the table. They will say, come on, get real. What are you talking about? So, and at the same time, to situate it also within the context of my academic work, when I came to the States, um, I'm Palestinian American. My mother was American, my father was Palestinian. I was born in the States. I grew up in Lebanon. I studied in Lebanon. In, I went through the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. I was on, I, hi, I evacuated out on a boat that was hijacked by the Israeli Navy and taken to Israel for interrogation. And then I got to the States right after this experience um, and I went to graduate school. And when I went for my PhD, I wanted to write about Arab American literature. And my professor said, well, it doesn't exist. And I thought, well, let's see. So I looked for it and I found it. <laughs> and at that time it was a very nascent body of literature and it was very hard to track down. Um, but I felt such a sense of erasure. I felt a sense of erasure on a personal level to speak of being Palestinian, almost impossible. To say that I wanted to study Arab American literature not, doesn't exist. So I felt like I had to prove my reality at every step. So when I chose to speak from the autobiographical, it was a very conscious political act as well as a personal act. Um, and in my essay, mm -hmm. I very consciously wove together the personal voice and the factual historical mm -hmm. um, events and the literary, because all of these had been suppressed. Um, the literary voices had been suppressed. The facts, the facts, the reality had been suppressed and still is. Um, and my own voice had been suppressed. So for me to simply speak out and to say, here I am, I'm real, I do exist. And I'm saying these things and I'm making these claims. And so I don't want, I, you know, you can debate about when something is theoretical and more distanced, anybody can debate it. But it's harder for people to look a person in the face and say, well, you don't exist. So that was my starting point and it was a mm -hmm. conscious starting point. 
and it's been throughout all of my work, both my um, critical work and creative work, um, and it's never been easy. <laughs> so, yeah. So, do you both bring it into your pedagogies as well? This very personal experience and your personal biographies. Well, <laughs> that's a really interesting question. Um, I'm sure I do in the sense that uh, whatever I do is shaped by it. Mm -hmm. But consciously, um, I don't think I do that, uh, you know, at a conscious level. And I just started teaching, of course, on mm -hmm. South Asian women's autobiographies. <laughs> right. So yeah. it's, it's, it's really interesting to, to think about my own kind of writing and, and, and uh telling of stories i guess <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, through through the lens of well, what some of the you know of what these writers have experimented with so it's interesting but uh, you know for me uh, there's a, I, I guess i just uh, worry about separating the autobiographical from the political and for me you know one of the biggest concerns and the, the kind of appreciation that i try to cultivate in my students is the necessity to act in the world i mean in a way we're all acting all the time but you take conscious action and mm -hmm. conscious responsibility for our actions mm -hmm. and so more than anything else you know in the old days we used to call this the divide between theory and practice mm -hmm. um is to really um you know um uh, teach students uh, to recognize the positions that all of us occupy, in, uh, whether it's in the university or, or outside, and the responsibility of what it is that we do with these positions that we occupy. And mm -hmm. so if we want to think about that as uh, drawing on the autobiographical, we could. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I prefer to think about it in terms of cultivating a sense of the urgency of the need to act for uh, a, a just world. Um, so certainly, yes, and uh, you know, I, I, I think that the autobiographical is very, very complicated and I'm just kind of beginning to unpack those threads myself. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I've located myself, my work for so many decades now in kind of the activist approach to learning, to being in the university, um, to doing what I do in the university, to try and create spaces within the university for building political solidarity across the growing racial colonial divide of the moment. Uh, that, uh, you know, that continues to be my framework. Um, so I don't know, I, I'd love to hear what Lisa has to say about this. Um, well, I wouldn't say I bring my, I don't, I, first of all, I don't teach full time. I've never taught full time mm -hmm. life. Um, when I was first trying to propose courses in the States before I moved overseas, it was hard to get a course um, accepted. Um, if it was going to be about Palestine or about um, an Arab topic. Um, so I would bring, so I would say that I brought my autobiographical concerns to the courses that I wanted to teach, but they weren't autobiographical. So I taught a um, Arab feminism, for instance, mm -hmm. and that felt very personal to me, but my autobiographic, autobiography was not part of it. Same thing when I taught about Arab American literature. Um, I, it was a personal concern of mine, but my own life was not um, part of it. So I would, and, and I would say that, it, I mean, as I said, it was hard to get courses accepted. So I really had to be very careful to, to put forward a very defensible uh, course that could not be accused of bias, which is always, always the problem. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think that, um, and, and then another thing is that, um, because one of the one of the books that I co-edited mm -hmm. looks at the transnational reception of uh, third world mm -hmm. and looks at the ways in which women's voices are are received and co-opted and framed and shaped by policies of translation and policies of marketing and policies of publicity. And so the Autobiographical Speech Act is not in itself um, the end. Um, and, you know, 
uh, the autobiographical voice can be used and misused. So in teaching, I would also try and bring that in too. So we would read a woman's narrative and then we'd look at the ways in which that could be used or abused depending on the on the need on what people were trying to do with it. And for Arab women, this is a very big issue because as you know, I mean, in, people want the narrative of the oppressed Arab and Muslim woman. And that's what sells and that's what gets airtime and they want the narrative of the Muslim or Arab woman who flees her culture who flees her country and goes to the West and is liberated um, so looking at autobiography even choosing text sometimes I would be very careful what text I would choose um, because I didn't it was it was sometimes difficult to to uh, complicate the reading that students wanted to bring to a text so all of these issues are they end up getting very complicated um, so, and so my autobiography informed all of this because of the ways in which I myself had been shaped by these discourses. I mean, you know, I would give a poetry reading and, you know, the question and answer would open up and the poems would have been mainly, let's say, about, I don't know, about Palestine or about nature or, and the first question would be, what about the oppression of women? And I'd be like, um, hey, I didn't actually read any poems related to that at all. So, yeah, so, yeah. I don't know if that answers can I, your, yeah. Sorry, can I just add something to that? Yeah. Um, I think, Lisa, it's a, it's a really important point that you're making about this whole prolifer proliferation of uh, narratives of cultural barbarism. Um, and so many of them are also being taught in the women's studies classrooms. Uh, so it's a, it's a real, uh, you know, charged issue, I think, in terms of what we take to be the autobiographical. And I suppose, you know, my uh, one of the things that I really try and get my students to think about is power, uh, power relations, understand how power is operating, the context in which the texts are written, they're being read, the context in which, uh, uh, at least as you pointed, they're distributed, circulated, promoted. And so context and the workings of power, I think those are the two issues that I really try and get my students to explore, to think about, both in terms of historical terms, but also in terms of the contemporary moment. How about now? Yeah. No. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I just wanted to thank you both for your comments because both of you are really powerful in reminding us that the autobiographical is not innocent, that it can also be, uh, you know, used and manipulated for particular political agendas, right? And it's, it's, it doesn't, it's not a truth teller on its own, uh, which is, should be uninterrogated. Um, and especially, you know, I, I as Lisa is talking about, you know, there's such a proliferation of first person accounts of, you know, women who have fled from Islam or women who have uh, fled from a culture. And, you know, they their careers have sort of gotten this boost from precisely this kind of autobiographical testimonial that confirms what the worst narratives are. So thank you for reminding us about that. Um, I wanted to sort of add on to that uh, sort of extend that a little bit because, um, you know, as Lisa reminded us, you know, we are still talking about um, the fact that can we say Palestine exists, you know, so many years later. Um, and, you know, in a powerful sort of call uh, in Lisa's essay for a kind of, you know, a demand to return, um, for, uh, you know, despite the many such powerful calls by now, there is still this kind of impossibility of return, right? For a, a, a nation whose very existence is negated uh, on a continual basis. Um, and that, that impossibility of return is also for Sunera in some ways as an immigrant scholar who is has been working in the Canadian Academy and sees herself at at home and writing about home uh, in many ways within Canada, but is, uh, you know, at, at particular strategic moments reminded that she is an outsider. So I wanted to ask you both about this kind of in-betweenness of your positions 
and um, uh, how how this in betweenness has influenced your ability to look at uh, different kinds of racialized dislocations um, and the connections between them um, in your poetry, in your scholarship. Um, I know Sunera's own interests are so uh, wide and varied and that she is obviously making these deep connections between um, different racial formations across geographies um, and their intersection with feminist projects. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, how do, how does this kind of place of in-betweenness for you, both of you um, manifest in your attention towards different kinds of racialized location, dislocations? And um, how does it make you think about other geographies, women in other geographies, and draw alliances with them? Um, well, Go ahead, Lisa. Okay. Um, it, for me, I should say that um, from the beginning, I mean, when I first was trying to think about my PhD, I actually was inspired by Maxine Hong Kingston, and her, it was her book, Woman Warrior, that first made me realize that one could write about these things and could, and that was a doorway open for me. And so I've always, I've always um, felt that that what I was paying attention to was not so much an idea. I mean, part of it was um, a culture and an identity that I was exploring, but part of it was exactly this, this um, position of being in between. And that could be in between two different countries. It could be in between within a family. It could be in, in between. Um, and it was always about um, power relationships as well, always. Um, and so that has really been the defining um, thing for me. And even, even in my own work, when I decided to study Arab American literature and culture, I again was not, I, I, I realized I didn't fit into the definitions because in those days when we studied ethnic culture, we studied groups. Um, but I didn't fit into the, I didn't fit into the parameters because ethnic groups are supposed to be, you know, the immigrant generation and then the generation born in the States and then you have a culture that grows up. And I, my very existence complicated that because I was born in the States, but I grew up overseas. I was, you know, one parent from one, one parent from another. And so I feel like I've, that in-between position made me also from the beginning pay a lot of attention um, to more of a mobility rather than a static look. So instead of looking at here's this ethnic group and let's look at it and what's happening, rather I was always attuned to the connections of connections to other places and the connections to other groups as well. And so even in, in the context of looking at issues of resistance, it's not just about what is happening to this one group, but what are the connections that we can make between groups who are, who are also trying to resist. And it's not an accident that, for instance, in Gaza, um, there are murals of George Floyd on the wall, you know, mm -hmm. connections that are transnational. And they're very important. And so um, being in between both personally and in terms of what I've been doing with my work has been very important and, and, it, and it feeds into an activism. So that we're never just looking at one cause, that's right, versus what, all the rest of it. We're looking at this working of power. We're looking at who is being disempowered um, and what is happening and how can we resist those structures rather than, um, rather than, than focusing on a particular group. I think that's how it's worked out for me. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. go ahead, Sunair. Okay, so the impossibility of return. Um, I think that I kind of live in a space between the impossibility and the necessity of return. Um, and the way I think about this necessity is, uh, you know, the places that we are in um, geographically. Uh, psychically, um, in, in many, many ways, uh, politically, socially, are shaped by histories of colonialism, um, of imperialism, and part of the colonial project, of course, was the destruction of the historical consciousness of colonized peoples. And so, you know, the, the, the kind of necessity to return is pressing and it's ongoing, because the alternative is an integration into Westernity. 
into colonial ideologies, into this ongoing condition of coloniality. And so while, of course, it is impossible to return, uh, and, you know, uh, I'm speaking in a different context than Lisa is speaking, where the right of return as a Palestinian is absolutely vital. Uh, uh, you know, but the necessity of return is there, and that's something that I face every day in my work. Because if I don't grapple with that necessity, then what I'm facing is a future of Westernity, uh, integration into a kind of, you know, violent colonial project that is spread across the planet. So, so that's how I think about that. The, the being at home. <laughs> Uh, I wonder whoever feels at home <laughs> and where that might be. <laughs> so I'm constantly reminded, of course, as a person of color in a white settler society, uh, that I am not at home. Um, you know, uh, the kind of uh, racial politics and the racial hierarchies that structure relationships uh, amongst different communities who live in, in, in this geography are very complicated, but they're a daily reminder that uh, to feel at home is uh, uh, not a, you know, it's not a good place to be. <laughs> um, uh, and in terms of, you know, uh, the, the in-betweenness, um, I think, you know, we know that the idea of boundedness, borders, is a myth. Um, that, you know, uh, global integration has been ongoing now for centuries, that the colonial kind of structure was global in nature. And so I think in-betweenness is the place that, you know, kind of uh, we are all at. And the idea that we are not is absolutely mythic. And to uphold that idea, you need states, armies, navies, militaries, because that is what, uh, you know, uh, polices the borders. Uh, and so in betweenness is a really interesting concept. And I think that, you know, um, the histories of colonization and globalization have in, in many ways, um, you know, created an in-betweenness that some of us occupy consciously and, uh, you know, through understanding and coming to terms with our own experiences. But the in-betweenness, you know, speaks to how borders, um, the idea of boundedness and being in a, not a space of in-betweenness is just totally mythic and a place from which great violence is enacted around the world. Um, anyway, that's, that's how I kind of approach these issues. Thank you so much, Sunara and Lisa. I'm popping back in again, because as you've seen, Pinky had some connection issues. Um, and we do have about uh, 10 minutes left still. I wanted to make sure that we made up for the, the time lost at the top. Um, so the next question was actually the one that I had opened the panel with while we were waiting for Pinky to join, which was noting that um, we are on the 20th anniversary, uh, not only of Meridians and of your essays uh, being published in Meridians, but of, of September 11th, 9-11, 9-11, and the war on terror, um, supposedly. Uh, and I've always noted two things, by the way. You know, September 11th um, was the not, is the anniversary of another date, the day that the United States, um, as part of its covert operations in Latin America, mm -hmm. ensured the destruction of the Allende democratically mm -hmm. elected presidency in Chile, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this question of uh, what counts as terrorism, who is being terrorized, who are marked as terrorists, um, has a has a long history uh, in 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 the world, um, mm -hmm. uh, such as we know it. So I was hoping that. Um, you could reflect again on the substance of those essays that you wrote for us in Meridians and um, the 20 years since then and this moment that we're in right now um, from that vantage point. Um, well, for me, I, wrote, I, I feel like I wrote this essay and then I left the States. Um, I left the States and I, right before September 11. Excuse me, just one. I'm going to shut the blinds. I'm so sorry. Yeah. So um, I left the States right before September 11. Um, and so I was outside watching the whole thing unfold and here in Cyprus because we have a British 
military base, um, I would go to the beach and I would hear the, um, uh, um, I would hear the planes taking off. Um, and this is after when the war started. And um, I, I felt a kind of a, my essay feels like, it's what I said to you in my email. I just, I feel like not much changed. I wrote the essay. Palestine, it was, it was, you know, a challenge to talk about the right of return then. It's almost impossible to talk about it now. The situation, Palestine has basically been disappearing ever since I wrote the essay. Um, I'm not sure what's left anymore. Um, I look at the militarization. I look at what the U.S. has done around the world, um, the war on terror. Um, and, yeah, it's a bit hard to know how to respond because I just feel like we're, uh, you know, Meridians is a wonderful journal because it makes a space for these kinds of um, articulations. So I feel like we're documenting, we're documenting. Um, I'm not sure <laughs> what's, you know, what we've been able to stop. I think that's where it, what it feels like. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I would agree. I just, this morning, I just woke up with a really heavy heart <laughs> because I knew one thing I had to do before uh, coming to this panel was to reread that essay. And, uh, you know, I did reread it this morning. I haven't looked at it for quite some time. And, you know, the, the world is much more violent today uh, than it was then. Um, you know, occupations and imperialist uh, proxy wars have become legitimized one more time. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we, we're seeing kind of the devastation that's been wreaked across the Middle East. The situation in Palestine is, you know, um, uh, I mean, what can one say? The situation just gets so much worse. Um, and for me, the, the, the point that I was trying to make in my essay was that the women's movement had to stop, had to intervene, had to mobilize against the war. That to me at that moment was the most urgent political task. Um, and today I look at a feminism that has been completely incorporated into imperialism. In fact, feminist discourse, feminist language, feminist kind of promises are the language of imperialism today uh, you know and i don't see it as a cooptation by the state which many feminists tend to see this situation as uh, you know i see feminism itself now as a kind of imperialist project and uh, you know uh, uh, i just think that uh, it's, it's a moment when we really have to rethink all of our political commitments and investments um, and uh, the urgency just couldn't be, you know, greater than it is at the moment, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, in terms of what is happening uh, in the U.S., but around the world as well. And, you know, I just think that the whole feminist project, feminist politics, I know we've talked about intersectionality, we've talked about women of color feminisms, but feminism still, you know, continues to remain uh, deeply, you know, in, in this moment. Uh, as it was in earlier colonial moments, you know, a totally compromised project that worked in the interest of certain groups of women, and it continues to do that today. Um, and so for me, this just is really crucial that we rethink some of our kind of accepted truths and wisdom. Uh, that doesn't mean, of course, that we give up the struggle for, for you know, women's liberation, however we might frame it. That task has become even more urgent but if, from my perspective, you know, uh, feminism doesn't give uh, uh, any kind of uh, uh, cause for optimism or hope today. And I think that, you know, this is something that we, you know, women's organizations are taking up on the ground as they, you know, uh, deal with this devastating condition. But it's something that is, has become a more important political project than it was 20 years ago. So I, I, I appreciate that. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, but I'm but so I, sorry. I, that's quite all right. I, I appreciate what you're saying, Sunara, and, and it resonates with me quite a bit, and I largely agree. But I think that, that if there's a space where we can find hope or to counter that otherwise, I think, correct um, assessment is in the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah. Uh, and, for example, the conceptualization of that movement offered by mm -hmm. Alicia Garza. 
and yeah. her her um, collaborators in that yeah. project. And in you know her her story of the Black Lives Matter movement, this essay that that she wrote, um, I think five years ago now, yeah. and in her new book about um, the practice of power, I mean, what is clear is that that is a feminist project front and center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, some might say it's been an intersectional feminist project, but but I think that label doesn't even do it justice because but because it is really truly a radical vision mm -hmm. of what constitutes social justice and mm -hmm. and human justice really like well you know yeah. this this at the most basic level um well being right the yeah. the good life when being you know which is movement in Latin America that likewise you know is being co-opted and used for to brand things now and yeah. it's just you know, right? but the idea is the 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 way that we can envision and 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 actualize um ways of living and structures for living that support life that are about um the, the human potential, right? And like having it be supported in every sense, right? From material, spiritual, psychological, cognitive, et cetera. So, so I think, and this is why you see the George Floyd mural in, in Palestine, right? It's because yes. the contemporary Black Lives Matter movement um, does have this kind of vision and has actualized, you know, an, an incredible gl global grassroots, um, you know, radical, revolutionary, you know, cimarronaje, like, so I'm thinking about the cimarrones, you know, the runaways, who, you know, in, in Latin America under the system of slavery in Spanish America, that, that, that is a place where we can find some hope, right? Mm -hmm. That is not working in those institutionalized models and, and has, you know, really offered us an, a, an important alternative um, and has been very effective in mm -hmm. calling us to the streets around the world, right? So, so I think if we can end on a, hopeful note, maybe it's by turning our gaze to what they have to teach us um, and how we can we can um, amplify amplify their voices um, in meridians, um, in our classrooms, in our writing, um, mm -hmm. and sometimes even just in the spaces of our own hearts, right? It's, it's um, it is 10, uh, 1159, I was an hour off, I'm, I apologize. And I, I um, am gonna go ahead and thank everybody for um, joining us, first of all, for sticking with us through the technical issues, I, our apologies. Um, but I think the conversation that we had, um, despite that, was amazing. I certainly was moved and and um, appreciated the rearchiving, the rearchiving that we've done today. Uh, and um, I want to join, invite you to join us for our very next panel, which will start promptly at twelve o'clock. Um, it is called. I should know this right now. A political vision: Indigenous feminisms in the art. Um, in the arts, excuse me. It will feature Nancy Marie Mythlo of UCLA, Bashuli Deb of CUNY Queens College, and our moder moderator Mona Hassan from Duke University. Um, I hope you will join us for that panel and for the ones that follow today. Thank you again for this lovely panel. Thank you, Pinky. Thank, thank you so much, and thank you for bearing with my many technical snafus. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for.